On this edition of the Vermont Motorsports Magazine Report, we'll be discussing Speed Weeks, the impact of Tom Crowley's recent memo, Ken Squire's award for media excellence, and Airborne Speedway's 60th season schedule. Strap yourself into the five-point harness, because we've got that, and much more on the Vermont Motorsports Magazine Report. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Vermont Motorsports Magazine Report. I'm Ricky St. Clair, a VMM correspondent and freelance sports writer at the Press Republican here in Plattsburgh, New York. For more insight regarding the show's creation, I'll send it to my co-host and VMM editor, T.J. Ingerson. Thanks, Ricky, and this is a great endeavor for, for all of us, you and I both. Um, something that we've discussed, you know, for a while now about what we wanted to do, and here it is, um, the Vermont Motorsports Magazine Report, a weekly feature um, on Vermont Motorsports Magazine, but it's just not you and me, and, and that's going to be the fun part. A guy that both both of us was brought to Vermont Motorsports Magazine to, um, a guy who's been a tremendous help to both of us. The reason why you and I are still here, and that is the Vermont Motorsports Magazine founder, Justin St. Louis. Thanks for joining us, Justin. Hey, guys. Thanks a lot. Uh, really excited to be part of this. Absolutely. So, Ricky, what is on tap tonight? Well, on uh, this edition of the Vermont Motorsports Magazine report, as you heard in the intro, we'll be talking speed weeks down in the Sunshine the Sunshine State. Excuse me. We have Tom Curley's recent memo that he released on ACTTour.com. Ken Squire was recently honored with uh, an award for media excellence from NASCAR, and uh, Sp- Airborne Speedway just released their 60th season schedule. But the first thing on the list, we've got Speed Weeks down in Florida, as I mentioned, the UNOH Battle of the Beach. It's the very first time our regional stars will be heading down to the Daytona International Speedway. They'll be racing on a four-tenths of a mile oval, and um, half of that track is actually made up on the backstretch down there at Daytona, um, featuring uh, this race features the NASCAR Wheel and All-American Series late models. They'll go 150 laps on Monday, February 18th. The Wheel and Modified Tour will click off 150 laps on Tuesday, February 19th, and will conclude with the K&N Pro Series with a 150 laps on Tuesday, February 19th. And, uh, guys, you know, this is a great opportunity for some of our regional stars to gain national attention. Um, you know, we've got a, a lot of of drivers from the Northeast who will set out to the Sunshine State and compete in these events. And, uh, TJ, what can, what can this do for some guys? This could, you know, potentially create publicity for um, regional series up here in the North, and um, hopefully some guys down south will, will get a good look at these, these guys. Absolutely. I mean, it is putting these drivers right in front of the team owners on the biggest race weekend in NASCAR. And and you don't have to go very far to look to see these drivers now. You know, when when team owners look for drivers, you know you're going all over the country trying to catch that next best talent. The talents of NASCAR in the weekly divisions and now the regional touring divisions are going to be in one area over over just over a week length. And and I think it's going to be a great event, um, great event for for weekly short track racing for the for the NASCAR home tracks group. Um, and I think it, it's going to be the start of, of something great. Um, Justin, what do you think of it? Well, you know, I've, uh, I've been involved with the NASCAR Wheel and All-American Series program um, sort of on an organizational level uh, with my involvement at Devil's Bowl Speedway for the last year. And, uh, I mean, anybody who's ever doubted anything, uh, or excuse me, any, any doubt with NASCAR's commitment to short track racing, you know, and this is easy for me to say being sort of on the home team, but, I, it's unreal uh, how much effort they put into uh, the whole home tracks program and the, and the Wheel All American Series. Say nothing of the Touring Series as well. You know the K and N and the Wheel Modifieds and all that stuff. Uh, this battle at the beach is a fantastic idea, and um, you know it, it's it's hard not to point at uh, the success of the Bond Auto Invitational over at New Hampshire Motor Speed with it, with that the American Canadian Tour started and, and Tom Crowley's brainchild there and. You know, this is really a model of that, um, but it, it, it has expanded in, to include, 
you know, the, the late models of the Wheel and All American series, the modifieds, the Canon East and West. It, it really brings out the best in uh, in everything, and and of course the champions from the uh, Canadian Tire Series, the Mexico Series, and the uh, Euro Euro Race Car Series uh, over across the pond. There, they're all included. Um, it's it's the best of the best, and and the way that NASCAR is doing it, from everything that I've seen, and, and the way that Joey Chitwood has put it all together at uh, Daytona, boy, it's going to be uh, quite the show. Yeah, it, it is, and I. I think it's going to be something that that becomes a yearly thing. I hope it becomes a yearly thing um, because the hype surrounding this, you know, who's going to go and, and who's going to be good. You know, you list, look at the list of modified drivers that are going to be going down there, you know, the list of k and Pro Series drivers, you know, and, and the list of, of potential NASCAR Wheeling All-American Series racers. You're taking the best NASCAR Wheeling All-American Series racers all across the country and putting them head-to-head on, a, on, on the same stage. I think that's that is one heck of an idea, and it's going to, you know, there's always the debate of, well, he didn't win because he races against more cars or, or he races starts up front. This, I think, is going to settle a lot of that debate head, head, head for head, on at least on Monday night. And then and then on Tuesday night, you take the best of the both series, uh, the, the Northern and Southern Modifieds, and then the East and West Pro K&M Pro Series, and you're putting those cars head to head. I think it's, I wish I was going down. I know that. Yeah, I, I really I have to agree with you there, and I think that uh, it's it's something that's attractive to drivers that aren't necessarily part of the NASCAR program as well. Uh, I know that there were a couple of AC team, ACT teams up here that were seriously considering going down to run the late model race on Monday. Um, in fact, uh, one of the drivers at Devil's Bowl Speedway um, had a, a deal all lined up, and then the sponsor backed out right at the last moment, um, and they were scheduled to go down, and it was... You know, this is this is something that's very real for everybody. Um, if you can find the finances to haul all the way down to Daytona, Florida in February, you can race at Daytona. How cool is that? You know, and then of course you've got everything going on at New Smyrna and uh, Volusia, and and it all kind of I don't know. Daytona, I guess, is the glue this year um, for the Speed Weeks thing. Uh, uh, you know, in terms of a, a short track level, of course, it is with the the Sprint Cup Series and the Daytona 500 and ARCA and Nationwide and trucks and all that stuff, but uh, you know, there's a real there's a real short track buzz around uh, around Florida right now, or around the country, but aiming at Florida, and it's it's a great thing. Do you think it it for short track fans? Do you think it increases, Justin? Do you think it increases um, their involvement because they are they are now at Daytona? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you, you I've I've been to the Thunder Road Banquet and the Doubles Bowl Banquet over the last two weeks. And everybody's talking about it. And Thunder Road's not a NASCAR track, and people are talking about the Battle of the Beach at Daytona. That's only a good thing. And it doesn't matter if you're an ACT driver or a NASCAR driver, or you race in the Wissota series out in the Midwest, or if you're, a, you know, out in California or, or up in Washington State. It doesn't matter. You you can be a part of this. You can race at Daytona. Yeah, I, I agree, and and I think it's it's going to be something great for short track racing. And something that a lot of us enjoyed with the old uh, Toyota Showdown at, at Irwindale, it was it it allowed us to recognize the stars we know um, in the middle of winter when when racing still two or three months out, and, and you look at those Connecticut fans that those modified faithfuls and and they're going to be able to cheer for their favorite drivers um, at Daytona and uh, on TV, and I think that's a that's a great addition with speed and, and TV and, and able to to broadcast these stars not just to the people that can go there. But to to the to a worldwide audience. That's right, TJ. And uh, you know, as I said a moment ago, the the weekly stars of the NASCAR Wheel and All American Series they'll be the first to tackle the the brand new oval down there in Daytona. And uh, race winners and series champions in the NASCAR Regional Touring Series they're already locked in, um, including the uh, top ten in the final NASCAR Wheel and All American Series standings. And as you mentioned, those you know those Connecticut faithful some names that many will recognize, Keith Rocco, Ryan Priest, Ted Christopher, among the many who are already locked into Monday night's opener. But also going down there, or going on down there, excuse me, at Speed Weeks is the World Series of Asphalt Stock Car Racing event. That's at New New Samirna Speedway, of course, a half-mile oval down there. Eight nights of racing. They are taking Tuesday, February 19th off, but many local connections down there at New Samirna Former TD Bank 250 winner Lightning Larry Gelinas will be down there. Alex Labby, he'll be piloting an American Canadian Tour car in 2013 for LaRue Motorsports. A uh, bunch of modified tour names from the Northeast will be making the trek down to the Sunshine State. And of course, Derek Griffiths, um, you know, 
Yeah. Will the, the UNOH battle help car counts at this event at New Smyrna, TJ? I think so. I think it, it, it it's going to help the modifieds a lot. And I think you hear um, just the other day I was I was on uh, social media and and saw that Burt Myers they were saying, hey, we're going down to to run at Daytona and then we're going to head over to New Smyrna and 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 run the uh, the um, uh, John Blue at the Third Memorial and the Richie Evans Memorial at New Smyrna. Um, probably they weren't going to go down if, if they weren't going to Daytona. So I think they're going to grab a lot of cars from, from that. I mean, there's there's even in the super late model, there are drivers sharing cars. Um, I think Dylan Kwasniewski, uh, the NASCAR k and West Series champion, um, is going to run at, at New Smyrna some nights. And that's a big name, a big young talent in racing that, that um, is going to be there. And, and, and there's more. I know Stephen Wallace is, is going to be racing at, uh, at New Smyrna. You said Larry Gelinas. Um, you know, a, a name that we're familiar with from from the north, and Martin Ladulup. You know, he's going to be running some down there too, uh, along with Alex Labby. So, I think it's. I don't. I can only think it's going to help at least to modify it and maybe draw some drivers, some prominent drivers, over to to New Smyrna when they're done at at um at uh, Daytona. And um, you know, also going down. Um, also going on down at Speed Weeks is the UNOH Dirt Car Nationals. That's at Volusia uh, Speedway Park, a half-mile dirt oval down there. Twelve nights of racing. They had to uh, up New Samirna Speedway. That's going on from Tuesday, February 12th through Saturday, February 23rd. That includes UMP modified sprint cars, which that uh, consists of the All-Star Circuit of Champions. That goes on February 13th and 14th. The World of Outlaws on Friday, February 15th. They'll race on through the weekend until Sunday, February 17th. UMP late models from February 18th to February 20th. The World of Outlaw late models from Thursday, February 21st to Saturday, February 23rd. And we'll conclude with the Super Dirt Car Series. Uh, that's Wednesday, February 20th, and we'll wrap up Saturday, February 23rd. Justin, I know you've had an opportunity to go down to Volusia Speedway Park in the past. That had to be a heck of an, ex- an experience. I-, I believe you saw the sprint cars down there. Is that correct? And it scared the hell out of me. Uh, most sprint cars are doing 145 miles an hour, and they do not get off the throttle in the corners. It's, uh, I'm telling you, I watched uh, Joey Saldana come from third to the win uh, one night. Or actually, he didn't win. Uh, he was leading with a lap to go, and then Steve Kinzer came back around him. Um, it was an incredible show, and that's that's just one division. You know, the late models, uh, the, the modified from the Midwest, the UMP cars, they'll run three or four wide all night long. And you've got kids like Ryan Gustin, uh, the Dillon brothers, Ty and Austin. You've got Ken Schrader, Kenny Wallace, uh, and that's just part of it. I, there's usually 80 entries for the UMP modified. So uh, what what an incredible experience it is to go down to uh, to Volusia County and watch that that uh, Dirt Car Nationals. It's awesome. And one of my favorite things is Ozzy Altman uh, is the announcer down there, and it gets no better in short track racing these days than uh, listening to the Ozman. There was a, a late model that flipped. Uh, on the front stretch, but I went down last year, the night that I was there, and uh, the car was not even done rolling over, and Ozzy is already standing at the edge of Pitt Road with a wireless microphone, and before the safety crew was out there, Ozzy Altman was in the in the driver's window, uh, the thing is smoking, and, and the guy's not even unbuckled yet, and Ozzy's out there describing the action from three feet away from the car on the front stretch. It's uh, it's quite the show, and, uh, you know, their car, they, they really uh, they put on a pretty good show down there. Um, it, it's really, it's a melting pot of the best short track racing talent, at least on dirt, um, in the whole country, uh, cause they come from everywhere. You know, you get the, the super dirt car series, which we're all familiar with up here in the Northeast, you know, Brett Hearn, uh, Timmy Fuller, Tim McCready, all those guys. Um, and that's one class of cars. You got the late models from the world of outlaws and the late models from UMP. You got the UMP modifieds. You got two sprint car series, the world of outlaws, you know, city Steve Kinzer and, Everybody knows what you're talking about. Um, Kyle Larson, who is a kid that we're all going to be talking about for a long, long time, and uh, he's going to be down there racing uh, a sprint car, from what I understand. Uh, Tony Stewart usually makes an appearance at some point. Uh, Casey Kane is usually there. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's a, a great effort by by uh, you know the World Racing Group with all their series, and uh, uh, it's dirt track heaven down there. And, TJ, you've got to imagine that fans are getting their money's worth. Look at the variety of cars I had mentioned, UMP modified sprint cars, late models. It all culminates with the Super Dirt Car Series. Um, 
you get your bang for your buck, as, as I'd like to say, I guess I'd like to call it. But, um, you know, when a fan uh, makes their way down there to Volusia Speedway Park, um, you know, they have the opportunity to see these different uh, types of race cars. That, that has to be a unique experience. Oh, it would be no doubt. I mean, every night you got a different double header. I don't say different double header, but you got a double header. You're either running, you're either seeing UMP dirt mods, you know, sprint cars, the late models. You know, every night you have two different types of cars racing. And as a fan, that's a that's an incredible bang for your buck. You know, and, and you get to see the best. You're not you're not just seeing um, a little dabble of this, a little dabble of that. Like Justin said, everyone flocks um, to Daytona and to Speed Weeks, and, and including Volusia. Um, especially for the Dirt Car Nationals, and I mean, I wish I could go. I, I said it before. I really wish I could go and, and just partake in it. I was able to watch last year online. Dirt Car does a great thing with their with their Dirt Vision. Um, I was able to watch it last year, and I think it made me even more jealous of the people that were down there, just because it, it just seems like an incredible, incredible experience. And guys, we're gonna we're gonna cut to a quick commercial break, but up next we'll be discussing Tom Curley's recent memo regarding his health and its impact on Thunder Road's future on the Vermont Motorsports Magazine Report. RPM Racing Engines in Georgia, Vermont, specializes in all high-performance engines, including racing, stock, drag, bow, and much more, and boasts a complete machine shop with a variety of services available. RPM Racing Engines serves tracks throughout the Northeast and has your Chevrolet crate race engine. RPM Racing Engines has your Ford Racing Engine, too, including the S347JR seen on the American Canadian Tour. RPM Racing Engines is also a dealer in many top brands, including AR Bodies, Bassett Wheels, Sunoco Race Fuels, and VP Racing Fuels. Give Rick and RPM Racing Engines a call at 802-524-7406 and visit their website at rpmenginesvt.com. Welcome back to this edition of the Vermont Motorsports Magazine Report. Up next on our agenda, Tom Curley, American Canadian Tour President, just recently released a memo on ACTTour.com about his recent health and its impact on the future of Thunder Road and the American Canadian Tour as a whole. And, uh, TJ, what was discussed in that memo that was just recently released? Tom covered a variety of topics in it, um, but... And, and he, he covered, starting back in the fall, the whole um, ACT casual thing up in Canada with PATH and the cars. Um, he discussed the purchase of Oxford Plain Speedway by um, PATH President Tom Mayberry. He discussed the uh, the state of the tires. Um, there was the report that Goodyear is getting out of short track racing. Um, he discussed um, that on a, on a late model level as well as as a support division level. Um, and he talked about what he was going to plan going forward, but a lot of it, a lot of this memo was about, um, himself and and that's not trying to be self-centered. That's updating what had happened, um, after the new year. And, and I know I was at the ACT banquet and it was, it was a shock to know that Tom wasn't there and it's like, well, what's going on? And, and when they announced that he had, he had was ill and, um, with a pneumonia and, and he was in a hospital and, um, it was, it was kind of taken back by it. it's like wow you know this is this is really serious I mean it's it's widely known that um, he has COPD um, which is a disease of the lungs that that um, that causes you to lose your breath more often um, shortness of breath um, and but he went into really really strict detail about um, his COPD and, and how he contracted uh, um, most likely the flu and how it really rapidly deteriorated up to a up to a staff infection. Um, and how that at one point they didn't they had they um Darla who's who's the vice president of ACT um had to call in his his family from Ontario um because it was that serious and but um I liked Ken Squire's line last week at at the Devils Bowl Speedway banquet um when he when he was up talking about the late models and he looked at everyone and he said well I got some bad news for you Tom Curley's getting healthy he's getting better and um it, it was really really this memo was something you look at and you go, this was really serious. And 
and he updated himself and everything going forward. Um, but you can see how much, how close it, it, it could have been to being very disastrous, in my opinion. And uh, before I send it over to Justin, I'm just going to read a quick statement from that memo regarding um, a, a potential future sale of Thunder Road. He said, Ken, in regards to Ken Squire and I, have been diligent about our Thunder Road negotiations for the past several years. It is very important to both of us that we put Thunder Road in the hands of the right organization. This was simply one more potential that we were exploring, and we, could, uh, we, can, we continue to look for the right deal and right fit for the future of Thun Road, its fans, and competitors. We realize it is time, and fortunately we are not in a position to make any kind of panic sale. Now, many years ago, Thunder Road was sold to a man from, I believe he was a, a, a business owner from Long Island, Tommy Calamaris, uh, he, you know, he um, infamously known as Tommy Thunder here in the Northeast, uh, 30-some years ago, made the purchase of Thunder Road. And, and Justin, when, when it was sold to him, what exactly happened to, to Thunder Road, the racetrack that we know now? Absolutely nothing, and that was the problem. Uh, Tommy Calamaris, you know, of course this happened before uh, any, any of the three of us were around, but, uh, you know, I've, I've done my homework on the subject, and uh, Tommy Calamaris had all kinds of great ideas and, and great intentions for Thunder Road. Uh, he planned on having uh, expanding the track to a half mile, possibly even a mile, to host the NASCAR Spring Cup Series, or what is now the Spring Cup Series. Uh, he was hoping to put a soccer pitch in the middle of the infield and host, you know, World Cup games and MLS games and have a team in Barrie, Vermont, which, you know, that's as laughable as, as saying that Thunder Road's going to, you know, be a dirt track. Um, you know, it's uh, he had all kinds of plans and absolutely zero money to, to follow through with them. Um, any picture that you see of Thunder Road from 1978, as few as there are, um, you know, there's grass growing up so high that you can barely see the, the, the race cars. Um, that's because he didn't have enough money to fix the lawnmower. Um, you know, it was that bad. You know, Tommy Calamaris, and I don't know the man, so I can't, uh, you know, I, I, I won't say anything further than that, but um, in short, he didn't follow through on anything. Um, that's a fact, and Tom Curley and, and Ken Squire learned a valuable lesson. And well, it was Ken Squire's track um, at the time, and um, when they finally got it back, uh, Tom Curley became a partner as he was at Catamount Stadium up in Milton, and um, you know, they learned a valuable lesson that the next time the Thunder Road sells, which nobody lives forever, so it's going to have to be you know transferred at some point. Um, it's got to go to the right organization and the right group, and somebody that's going to make sure that that track stays Thunder Road as we know it. Um, it took a long time for, for Thunder Road to bounce back. It went through a real bad period of about five years. Um, and then finally, in 1982, it reopened full time. And, uh, you know, you see what it, what it has become, you know, today and, and over the last 25, 30 years. Um, it's, it's a huge, huge deal in the industry of short track racing. You know, it was uh, just, it wasn't even a decade ago, 2004, that Tom Curley was voted uh, the National Promoter of the Year for his efforts with Thunder Road and the American Canadian Tour. The Milk Bowl was voted the number one event in the country in 2006. Um, this place is a, uh, it's near and dear to all of our hearts, uh, you know, and as a driver, as a fan, as a media member, as whatever, you know, a sponsor, whatever your involvement is at, at Thunder Road, even if you only go once a year, you know that it, it, there's something special about that place. And, um, you know, obviously Ken Squire and Tom Curley know that, and uh, they want, on the road to survive and, and flourish and only get better in time um, rather than go the other way like it did back in the late 70s under Calamaris's watch. Um, that having been said, you know, it's only really become public knowledge um, in the last month since since Mr. Curley released his, his letter that uh, Thunder Road has been on the market. Well, I know that they've been actively shopping the racetrack for almost 10 years at this point. Um, there have been people that have been looking at the track and some are just tire kickers and some are serious, but um, you know, they haven't found the right fit and they're not willing to give Thunder Road up until they do find the right fit. And, you know, the rumor is that Ken, Ken Schrader is going to buy it. Tony Stewart's going to buy it. Kenny Wallace is going to buy it. Well, that may very well be eventually, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, and I'm not going to speculate that, that they will buy it. It's going to be somebody who's dedicated to it. It's got to be somebody who cares about it. And I think, frankly, it's got to be somebody local who knows the history of the track and uh, and can follow through on the traditions of, you know, we just had the 50th milk bowl, 50 years of a milk bowl. And that's, 
pretty important. Um, you know, the Memorial Day Classic celebrated its 50th anniversary. Um, it, there's so much involving Thunder Road that uh, infiltrates the entire state of Vermont, and not just Barrie, and not just Washington County, but everywhere, and New Hampshire, and New York, and Maine, and wherever. Um, it's a big, big deal. It's an important thing to everybody, and Tom and Ken don't want to see that uh, go away. Yeah, going back to 1978, we were talking obviously obviously about a Long, Long Island business owner. That's uh, Tommy Calamaris, Tommy Thunder, as he's infamously known in the Northeast. Only six events ran in 1978, four times the headline division, the late model sportsman. Four times they ran in 1978. But, Justin, you just threw out some names out there like Kenny Schrader, Tony Stewart. I know uh, one morning I was listening to a Vermont radio station. Kevin LePage was on. He thought about making a potential purchase down the road, or he was in the talks with Ken Squire. TJ, how important is it for for Tom Curley and Ken Squire to find the right replacement? It's hugely important. You know, I and I think it's because of, of I don't say be selfish, but it's people like me who, you know, I went to Thunder Road, started going to Thunder Road Weekly in, in 1998, and I went almost every week for 10 years, and I I have all those vivid memories of of going there every week and and being able to to see the stars that that I thought were 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 pretty famous to me you know um, I remember that those the the great late nineties we battles between between Phil Scott and Brian Hoare um, and and you know I remember Mike Bruno racing there and and Dave Wickham and Tracy Bellrose and all that and, and those are all memories to me and and it's important to to Central Vermont. And I came from New Hampshire. I came just over the border, um, uh, just over the Connecticut River from New Hampshire, and, and I go. I went every week. So it, it it it's not just Central Vermont. It is wide ranging. People that have memories there, and and it's near and dear to to Tom and Ken, especially Ken. You know, and I think they want. I I don't want to speak for them, but you know, I, I believe that they want to make sure they find the right person. So the next generation of people can have the same memories that I have, and and I wrote it in in Jack stands this week that in in ten or fifteen years I want to be able to to take my children with me to Thunder Road and have the same same enjoyment and the same memories that I was able to create at Thunder Road and you know it's a big part of my history um, growing up and I think I think they want to make sure that it stays a racetrack it stays a great racetrack um, in for now and into the future and. And, and like Tom said, they're going to do their due diligence. They're not in a position to make an impulse sale. And I think that is just absolutely great um, that they're not willing just to, to, to see someone bring up a load of cash and, and drop a number in front of them and say sold. And that they're going to make sure that they find the right person um, to take them into the next era. I want to just expand on that if I can. I want to just expand on that if I can. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Ricky, but I really think that even if uh, if Tom Curley hadn't been able to survive um, everything that happened to him over this winter with his health issues, Thunder Road would have survived, uh, you know, at least in, in the short term of a run of a couple of years, if not longer, um, you know, without without Tom Curley, and it wouldn't have been a problem. Nobody would have no, noticed any difference um, because of the great staff that they've got in place there. Um, and I've worked with that staff, and I know that uh, – They've got everything down, you know. I remember back in in 2001 when uh, Tom Curley was suspended for for his own actions in the pits, uh, and there were some big races that happened without him, and nobody noticed the difference at all. Um, that that group has been in there for a long time, and and they can swing those gates open and have the same great racing, and and Thunder Road will be just fine. Um, and that's that's a testament to Tom and and the leadership that he's got with that group and and uh, everything that he's put into place. And um, you know, it, it's a good thing that they don't have to rush to sell the place. But even if they did, um, the people that are running it right now will take care of it. But for the time being, uh, 2013 looks bright for the American Canadian Tour. Uh, in, in the memo, well, actually, I believe it was just announced recently that the ACT Castrol Series. Uh, full timers who commit through the entire schedule will receive a bonus. Uh, TJ, I know Tom Curley um, has been a big supporter of, as we like to call, 100 percenters, the top qualifying cars who have, you know, made an attempt at every race on the schedule. 
um, throughout the year. You know, if, if they can qualify their way into the future event, they'll start at, with a provisional. But uh, this year, those Castro guys have an opportunity to earn bonuses by by attending. You know, every race. Yeah, and and that's a big testament to to the promoters up there that that really put this together at um at Santa Stash and and Monami and and um, Riverside. Um, they did. They put this deal together, um, and you get into the past deal. Um, going to going to Chaudière, that they they knew um, they needed to to help stabilize it. You know, and and when Tom announced the International Five Hundred, I thought it was was a telling tale that he started talking about Quebec first, and and that's a big deal to Tom because he when he took over the Quebec series. I mean, he admitted it. It was in it was in shambles, and and they've helped develop it and they helped grow it, and and I think with Castro and and the promoters up there, they they don't want to see that disrupted, and, and um, they've put together a pretty good deal for for all the drivers up there that that um, support the entire the entire Castro series, and I think it's it's only going to help them, in my opinion, um, that that uh, that they have this deal, and and it's going to put bring a lot of the top name guys continuously to, to the casual series. And, and you're going to know they're going to be there. And, uh, you know, on the U S side of things, a 14 race schedule has been announced in that memo. Uh, Tom Curley had said, we decided to significantly expand the 2013 schedule with the addition of events at deserving ACT affiliate tracks that have supported the ACT late model program. And then he go on, he goes on to talk about Thompson speedway, Arguably, you know, one of the best short tracks in the, in the new in excuse me the New England region, um, who will also have a, a spot in the 2013 schedule. Of course, that will be announced at a later date. But Justin, um, after the sale of Oxford Oxford Plain Speedway in Oxford, Maine, uh, Tom Curley, president of the American Canadian Tour, he decided to add an additional non-points race with a huge purse that will potentially match that of the Oxford 250, and that's going to occur. At, in Plattsburgh, New York, at Airborne Speedway, and, is, and it is dubbed the International 500. It will consist of three 100-lap races for the American-Canadian Tour-type late models and two 100-lap uh, Mazda-style races for the Airborne Speedway dirt car modifieds. Can you talk a little bit about that event before uh, ass- assessing the 2013 U.S. schedule for the American-Canadian Tour? Well, the International 500 is exactly how you put it. It's a direct response to uh, Tom Mayberry and past taking over the Oxford 250. Um, anybody who's been around longer than uh, a year or two knows that Tom Curley likes a good fight. He said as much at the Milk Bowl. Um, you know, he's in this thing for the long haul, even if it kills him, quite literally. And, uh, you know, this is, this is something that uh, I grew up on uh, when NASCAR was pulling out uh, in 1985 from, uh, from the North Tour and when the American Canadian Tour was created. And uh, with all the battles that can out, and, and Tom had just come off, you know, what we discussed with, with Tommy Calamiris at Thunder Road. And, um, you know, then, of course, ACT had its problems with, uh, ironically, the same Oxford Plain Speedway with Mike Liberty back in the, in the mid-'90s. Um, and, you know, this is something that, that Tom has thrived on forever. And he's up, he's up for a fight. He's, he's got the Irish up. And this International 500 is old-school promotion, head-to-head stuff, big names. Drivers are going to have to be forced into choosing where they want to be. That may not be a good situation for the drivers, uh, but it's a great deal for the fans. And even if this uh, race was was born out of something that some could view negatively, um, you know, with this changeover of the Astro 250, it's going to turn into a huge positive for racing because there's two major events going on. And you know, in the in the in the past, the Astro 250, I guess, was the big thing to do because that's all there was to do. Um, on that weekend. Now you've got a choice. And if you live in Plattsburgh, New York, well, you've just saved yourself a six hour trip and a, and a trip across the boat to go to the Astro 250. Now you can just go right in your, in your hometown, um, and watch the International 500. The racing is going to be outstanding no matter which track you choose. Uh, Oxford's always been a great track. And the Super Late Models, the Pro Stocks, whatever you want to call them, they're always going to be great at Oxford. It's a great type of race car and Pass has a good format. And, you know, that's going to be fine for them. Um, but if you want to go watch the ACT cars that you're used to watching, I'm telling you, it doesn't get any racers on Airborne Speedway. You know, two and three wide all day long. 
you know, look at the fall foliage 300 uh, a couple years ago. There were 19 lead changes. Patrick LaPearl came from the back with, you know, 40 laps to go to win the thing. Um, that's what you can expect at this International 500 event. And uh, I, I really think that it's, that it's going to be an exciting thing. You know, you look at uh, – they're, they're doing this segment on Thursdays on the ACT website – um, called Unbuckled, where they interview a driver. Every single one of them has said that the race they're looking forward to the most is that International 500 at Airborne. That's not even a championship race. It's not even a points race. It's just something that they all want to go to, um, and they can't wait for it. So that's a, that's got to be a good thing for ACT. It's certainly a good thing for uh, fans from uh, Vermont and New York who, who weren't necessarily up for the travel of the Oxford 250. Um, they've got something sort of in their own home turf now, and uh, I think that'll be a, I think it'll be a huge success. And, uh, you know, we've talked about the American-Canadian tour in 2013 on, on, in terms of, you know, both sides of the border with the U.S. series and, and its schedule and the Castro series up north. But Thunder Road, um, the 2013, is shaping up to be a good one over at the Barry Quarter Mile. Uh, TJ, from what I understand, it looks like Gene Paul Sear is going to be running weekly at the Barry High Banks. Yeah, he um, he announced that on, on, on their Unbuckled segment that, um, he was looking to run weekly at, at Thunder Road, and, and he he traced it back to the one year he uh, he ran Thunder Road and was able to win the championship there. That he was able to have memories and, and have discussions with his kids about the racetrack and be able to come home and, and talk about his kids about that. And that's something that I think he he enjoyed, and um, he he wants to run Thunder Road again, and and he's it sounds like he's going to do it. So it's a big get for Thunder Road weekly. It's a you know. It, if if Gene's not going to run the tour um, weekly, you know, he, I mean, he's a seven-time champion on the tour. That's that's a big loss, you know. And um, but I think it's a great addition, great addition to Thunder Road. And uh, Justin, we've got a couple of drivers in that late model division who are uh, going to be hopping in some some new rides in 2013. Cody Blake, uh, young kid's going to be dry, piloting a Jason Allen owned late model for the full season at Thunder Road for 2013 after spending three years behind the wheel of uh, his North Country Auto number 99 Vermont car and Derek O'Donnell is going to be jumping into Cody Blake's former ride in 2013. That's an interesting uh, trade off there. I know that um, I- I'm a big believer in Cody Blake and I certainly think that uh, Derek O'Donnell has the stuff behind the wheel to get it done too. Um, that, uh, that Mercedes team, the 99 team, uh, has really proved, well, I guess they're going to be number 60 or 68 or whatever they've, they've decided on. Um, but anyway, the car that, that, uh, Cody Blake was driving, uh, you know, they've proven that they can run up front. Yeah, they didn't have a win at Thunder Road, but they, how many times have they second or third, um, over the last few years? And, and they've really, uh, made themselves into a, a very good team. And, and, uh, I think Derek O'Donnell has, the, has the goods to get it done. You know, you, you saw what he did over at, uh, the, uh, race and uh, the 200 lapper there over at Grove and um, in his first start in the car um, that's obviously I, I think that's just a harbinger of things to come with that team um, and like I said I, I'm a big believer, in, be a believer excuse me in Cody Blake um, I've seen what he can do um, you know right up from the time he was in the, the kids truck division over at White Mountain um, all the way up through to the late models and, and I'd say you know he won that uh, most improved driver award two years in a row at Thunder Road for a reason um, he really has grown as a driver. He's still young. I think he's only 20 or 21 years old. Um, and he's got all the time in the world to, to grow up and mature as a racer. Um, I think he's well on the way to, to getting there. Um, you know, he may not be as, as flashy as, say, a Joey Pole or an Austin Terrio or, or whatever you'd like, but um, he's definitely got the ability. Um, there's a couple of rookies coming into the late models as well. I'm excited about Jason Corliss. Um, you know, that's, that's a, a team that they are doing as much as they can with as little a budget as anybody at, at Thunder Road. Um, you know, they've had a very good run in the Tigers. Um, they've got a good late model car. And uh, Jason is certainly a, an exciting driver to watch, um, you know, in and out of the car. Um, I, I remember him, you know, kind of giving the old two-finger salute to, uh, I don't even remember who it was, but uh, right on the front stretch there a couple years ago. And, you know, he's passionate about it. Um, Chris Burnett is a is a guy that uh, is he's the owner of the car and um, you know he comes from a racing background. He spent a lot of team a lot of time with the RPM team, helping out Brian Hoare and um, you know being associated with him for years. So he's got a lot of knowledge. Jason Corliss brings a lot of talent. Um, I think that team is going to be one to watch as well, um, especially as a first year team. But I think uh, you know they're they're going to be in contention to win by the end of the summer. 
And, uh, you know, Jean Paul Sear, a seven time American Canadian tour champion. He, of course, from Milton, Vermont. He uh, was racing full time at Thunder Road in 2009 after, you know, dominating the American Canadian tour, so to speak. And uh, he ended up winning the track title in his first year back, that, that of course, in 2009. And, uh, TJ, you look at this field. Gene Paul Sear, he is now rejoining the likes of Nick Sweet, David Pembroke, the lieutenant governor of the state of Vermont, Phil Scott, a former time track, a former track champion and multi-time milk bowl winner, um, Blake, Cody Blake, Derek O'Donnell. We just mentioned those two. Of course, Trampus Demers is coming back. W- would you argue that this field might be more competitive in 2013 than it has in quite some time? Absolutely. I mean, you you look at the the amount of talent that's there and the ability for anyone to win. Um, you know, and I, I know we said that last year um, with Trampus Demers stepping up his program and um, Dave Pembroke, we're just coming off a title season, and, and Cody Blake looking to the next step, and then next week kind of run, ran away from it. But, again, the weekly talent at Thunder Road is among the best around in New England. Um, like you said, you know, Gene Paul Sierra, you know, the 2009 track champion, you know, all those guys, you know, are expected to be back. And and then you have the newcomers, also, and then you have the guys that could step up their program over the summer. You know, there's a lot of those guys. You know, Brooks Clark. Um, you know, he's he's always he's been there for a couple of years looking for that win. Was able to pick up his first career win um, two years ago, and and he's been steadily improving every single year and and, and moving himself up the rank and, and becoming a consistent threat every week. So. Um, the level of talent and, and the level of competition at Thunder Road week in and week out, I mean, it, it shouldn't p- keep people away because it's among the best in, in all of New England, I think. Well, fellas, we're going to cut to a quick commercial break. But up next, we'll be discussing Ken Squire and his NASCAR Award for Media Excellence and Airborne Speedway's 60th season schedule on the Vermont Motorsports Magazine Report. Goss Dodge Chrysler is the place to find your new or used car, including the 2013 Dodge Caravan, the 2013 Dodge Dart, or the Man's Rig, the 2013 Dodge Ram. Goss Dodge Chrysler has hundreds of vehicles ready for you to test drive today at their dealership on Shelburne Road in Burlington, Vermont. Goss Dodge Chrysler has been number one in sales in New England for two consecutive years running and is ready to help you purchase a new Dodge, Chrysler, or used car. Visit their website at gothcars.com. This edition of, of the Vermont Motorsports Magazine Report. I'm Ricky St. Clair, and of course, uh, and of course, joining me are my co-host, Vermont Motorsports Magazine editor T.J. Angerson and founder of VTMotorMag.com, Justin St. Louis. Guys, at Friday's fourth annual NASCAR Hall of Fame induction ceremony, current Motorsports Racing Net- Network announcer Barney Hall and former Motorsports Racing Network voice Ken Squire of course, from the Green Mountain, say they were awarded the first recipient of the Squire Hall Award for for NASCAR Media Excellence. TJ, what what impact did Ken Squire, a local boy from the Northeast here from the Green Mountain, say what impact did he have on NASCAR? Put it simply, NASCAR probably wouldn't be where it is today without Ken Squire. Um, you know, he brought a great attention to to what was a a a normal guy's sport, he brought mainstream attention. You know, helped founded um, the motor Na- motor racing network, um, helped sell um, a flag to flag broadcast of NASCAR's biggest race, the Daytona 500, to CBS, and then became was was known as the voice of perhaps its greatest moment that that everyone always knows. And and, and when you see the 1979 Daytona 500 and the fight that everyone knows about the one name, the one voice you hear, excuse me, is Ken Squire, you know, and I think it's safe to assume, safe to say that NASCAR would be nowhere where it is now in the prominence that it is in the, in, 
in the standing that it is um, with national media um, without without Ken Squire. And I know Justin works uh, closely with Ken. Um, would you agree, Justin? Yeah, I, I mean, I I think that goes without saying. You know, it's uh, you may not even know his name, but you know his voice. Um, he coined the term the Great American Race. Uh, he was the one that put uh, a camera in a race car uh, for viewers at home to see what's going on. You look through the driver's eyes. Um, I can remember clear as day the first time that I saw, you know, the in-car camera from Cale Yarborough uh, at Daytona in the Daytona 500 back in the early 80s, um, you know, and, and he wins the race with the CBS camera in there. I mean, how cool is that? Um, you know, Ken Squire did so much for NASCAR and still does um, that uh, that gets uh, gets it out there in the public eye. Um, there was nobody willing to to entertain the thought of having a, a 500 mile race in its entirety on television. Um, and you know we're talking back in the in the late 70s when there were three or four channels on TV, so you had to watch it. <laughs> um, and and that ultimately is is what got NASCAR on the map. Um, you know, there's that, that fabled snowstorm that, that locked most of the East Coast indoors um, on the day of the t- Daytona 500, and uh, there's nothing else to do except watch TV, so we're going to watch what's on, and, you know, it's the Daytona 500. It's the first time most of America has seen this, uh, this race, and it just so happens to have the greatest ending to any race in the history of racing. Um, that doesn't happen without Ken Squire, um, and, and that really is what set NASCAR on the path to, to being a, an internationally popular uh, sport. It's a mainstream sport. It's the number two uh, spectator sport in America, um, right behind the NFL, and that wouldn't have happened without uh, without Ken Squire's vision and, and his drive. Um, you know, and that's uh, it's pretty cool that that started right back here in Vermont, but really it could have come from anywhere, um, and he's certainly uh, deserving, as is Barney Hall. Um, who has been on MRN ever since the beginning, you know, the Motor Racing Network. And that's a company that, that uh, Ken Squire helped to found with, with Bill France um, from NASCAR. And, you know, um, Barney has been there for you know, almost 50 years and uh, is, is a familiar voice and, and one that the NASCAR fans depend on. Um, and uh, both of them very deserving of, of the award and, uh, congratulations to the both of them. But, you know, of course, we're biased because we know Ken and, and you know, we've grown up with Ken. And, um, it couldn't have happened to a, you know, it couldn't have happened any other way. Um, and, and Ken Squire was the guy driving the driving the wagon. One thing I want to say is, you know, like you said, the number two spectator sports of the NFL. Anyone who knows the NFL knows NFL Films and Steve Sable and how important those two entities that Sable founded NFL Films is to the NFL. Ken Squire is of equal importance to NASCAR, and and, and uh, it wouldn't be where it is without Ken Squire. Well, and I think of Motor Week um, on, on TBS, the old uh, motorsports program that covered everything, um, not just NASCAR, but, but Formula One and IndyCar and whatever. Um, and that was a that was a breakthrough moment for, for media, for sports media. Um, and now, you know, there's hundreds of imitators, um, including this show right here. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, let's be honest. Um, maybe none of this would have happened without um, Ken Squire taking the risk that he did and and, uh, and trying to get this thing out there. You know, we're not just a bunch of rednecks. This is, you know, people from all walks of life. Hello, we've got the lieutenant governor racing a, a short track race car, uh, you know, every Thursday night. Um you know, this is uh, this is as much a, a part of America as anything, and and Ken really saw that that needed to be out there, and and uh, and we got to show the world. And guys, the members of the 2013 class include Buck Baker, Cotton Owens, Herb Thomas, Rusty Wallace, and Leonard Wood, which is a perfect segue to my next next question. And and TJ, I'll start with you first. Justin, feel free to chime in. Should Ken Squire be enshrined in in the NASCAR Hall of Fame? Yes. No questions asked, and no no questions asked for me. I, and he probably will be. He will be eventually enshrined, um, because he had an, a huge impact on on NASCAR, like we just discussed. And and I, there's no doubt in my mind that he'll be enshrined at some point. Um, selfishly, though, you know, kind of hope it's he'll be sooner than later. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. Um, I think that there's a place for Chris Economaki as well. 
um, and, and several others that are very deserving. But, you know, um, yeah, absolutely. There's there's no doubt in my mind that eventually Ken Squire will be in the NASCAR Hall of Fame, whether it's next year or five years down the road or, or you know, long after we're all gone. Uh, he certainly deserves to be in there. And I know there was an argument um, by Jeff Gluck of the USA Today that, that the Hall should really only focus on the on the guys who who participate in the sport. And, and again, I wholeheartedly disagree because at certain points NASCAR wouldn't be where it is without these certain people. Uh, without these certain people, no way, shape, or form NASCAR would be without Big Bill and and, and uh, Little Bill. No way. Um, they both had the foresight to to take it to its next era. Um, and and you know owners and and crew chiefs and and stuff like that you know and, and I'm not trying to up, up play our points because we're part of the media but you know the media helps tell that story and and one of the best if not the best um is Ken Squire because of, of his importance to NASCAR and 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 no one would have known not as many people excuse me would have known Dale Earnhardt um without without Ken Squire or or insert driver a here through the 80s and 90s you probably wouldn't know about him even even in today because of his importance laying the groundwork you know 30 years ago i i'll expand on that one more time here and uh again another local uh reference russ conway who was a, a great promoter down in southern new hampshire with lee and hudson and star speedways um and the the new england super modified uh, racing association he's in the nhl hall of fame as a writer um there's no difference. Um, you know, Russ Conway was a huge part of hockey media um, for a long, long time, and he got elected into the Hockey Hall of Fame. Um, excuse me, not the NHL Hall of Fame, but the Hockey Hall of Fame. Um, he's very deserving of that honor. Um, he's as much a part of the sport as, as the players and the coaches and, you know, anybody else. Um, and I, I really believe that that's no different for Ken Squire or, again, like I said, Chris Economaki. Um you know, you go back to, I think Mike Joy um, should be in the Hall of Fame at some point. Um, you know, look at everything that he's done for for radio and television media. Um, yeah, and the list goes on, you know, for, for every Ken Squire, there's there's five more. I mean, one other name you throw out who's probably known more for his media than he is his, his driving, that's Benny Parsons. You know, you know, growing up in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, you know, that's one of the things you, you remember about NASCAR is, on ESPN was was Benny Parsons and um, uh, Bill um, Bill Jenkins Bob, Bob, Bob Jenkins, Jenkins yeah. excuse me um, yeah Ned Jarrett Ned Jarrett Walter you know, Wallace, guys like that on and on. yeah you know and 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 Benny Parsons is probably known more for his media um, assistance than he is his uh, his driving and he's a, he's a NASCAR champion so it it tells you the importance of of NASCAR media and helping bring it to the forefront and and Ken Squire is driving the steer in the ship, in my opinion. Again, you're listening to the Vermont Motorsports Magazine Report. I am Ricky St. Clair, a correspondent for VTMotorMag.com, and, of course, joining me, T.J. Angerson. He is the current editor of Vermont Motorsports Magazine and founder, Justin St. Louis. Guys, Airborne Speedway in Plattsburgh, New York, just released the, its 60th season. Uh, it's, it's scheduled for its 60th season, excuse me. Um, 20 events on the schedule. And the opener is the Charlie Trombley Memorial 60 for the Ernie's Discount Tools Dirt Car Modifieds. That, of course, will be presented by Econo Lodge on Saturday, May 4th. Um, other notable dates are included in the American Canadian Tour Fall Foliage 200, the late, models, late model tour's final points race. That closes out the season on Saturday, September 28th. Um, I know earlier in this program we talked about the International 500. That a, that's a two-day event, Saturday and Sunday, July 20th and 21st. Um, we can't forget to mention the second annual TRD Trailer Sales Renegade 100. That is slotted for Memorial Day weekend, Saturday, May 25th. Uh, the North Country's largest fireworks show in full race car, that's Saturday, July, uh, June 29th. Uh, July 6th, Airborne is hosting the USA Canadian Limited Late Model 60 Lap Challenge. And, of course, the Northeast Midget Association, also known as NEMA Midgets, and the NEMA Lights will make their first Airborne appearance in over 40 years on August third uh tj three act races one of them of course that non-points race with the international 500 um they get an additional uh, you know airborne speedway gets an additional american canadian tour points race with a 100 lapper earlier in the year um last year mike parati promoter at airborne speedway 
He wanted to focus more on giving back to its local to his local racing community and having less touring series come into the to the Plattsburgh Half Mile. This year, he's giving fans a variety uh, of race cars joining the uh, 2013 schedule. As I said, three ACT races, NEMA. Uh, the, the Renegades have an extra distance event Memorial Day weekend. But, um, you know, you look at those three ACT races, this is something that fans from across the Northeast, especially New England, they've got to be looking forward to that. The one thing I like about touring series is, is it, it it breaks up the monotonous schedule of weekly racing. It offers something different, and and sometimes you can't you can't afford touring series, and or, or you want to give back to your local racers, and and sometimes that weekly schedule gets a grind and a grind and a grind. But even what what Airborne's doing this year with offering different race distances and, and bringing different series, and I, I think it's great. It, it offering something unique every week, much like you know Devils Bowl Speedway is with Justin and Mike Bruno this year. They offer something a little different every week, and it kind of breaks up the the monotonous grind of a weekly schedule that you're going to see the same thing over and over and over again. Um, I tell you what, if if I could go to that NEMA show, those NEMA midgets are going to fly around Airborne, and and the three ACT races. Um, I mean, we've seen all the previous ACT races and how great they are. So, um, I think it's going to be another great season, a great 60th season for Airborne. Um, and and again, just just the entire work, body of work, the differences, the you know even the mini mods are going for 60 laps this year. The Renegade 100, 100 was, I mean, I heard it was an excellent race. Uh, I know you did too, Ricky. And, and I think again that that's a great show on Memorial Day weekend for them. And and I think it's going to be a, a heck of a season for them. Mike Parati, the uh, promoter at the Plattsburgh Half Mile, was quoted as saying, "I believe the two-day International 500 event is going to be huge." The purses total over $100,000. There will be a lot of teams and fans traveling to Plattsburgh from north of the border, from all over New England. It will give our Modifieds a lot of exposure. I'm also pleased with the growth of our Sports and Modified class. This is the second year, and it's looking uh, that we'll have over 20 teams competing weekly Weekly, excuse me, in that support division. Uh, Justin, I know with your involvement at Devil's Bull Speedway in West Haven, Vermont, you also have a Renegade class, a V8 class, that competes weekly at the Half Mile in West Haven. These renegades at Airborne, they get an extra distance event, as I said, slotted for Memorial Day weekend. And I think the three of us could argue that, that this division might be one of the most competitive in the Northeast. I'm sure fans are excited for that 100-lap race on Memorial Day weekend. I, I definitely am. I'm going to try and get over there for that one. Um, it's uh, I love the look of the renegades, first of all. It's, it's old school. Uh, you know, they look like a race car. Um, I really, really, really enjoy Renegade racing. And, and it's not just at Airborne. You know, I like them at Devil's Bowl. You go down to Waterford Speed Bowl in Connecticut, um, and their street stock division, um, and it's the same cars uh, that compete at Thompson Speedway. Um, I mean, outstanding racing, three and four wide. Um, it is it is a great, great division, uh, really, any, any track you go to. Um, and that 100 lapper, I wasn't able to get to the one uh, that they had this past year, but, um, uh, you know, like you guys, I heard that it was a, a wonderful show and, and uh, you know, something that's that's really, uh, for a support division, it gets a lot of hype, and uh, and I think it's well-deserved. And, uh, of course, we can't forget about mentioning April 19th and 20th. Again, that is Friday and Saturday uh, at the Crate Memorial Civic Center in Plattsburgh, New York. It will be the annual Mike Watts Memorial Car Show, um, a big fan favorite. Uh, TJ, We've talked about this in the past, these car shows. I know, you know, Devil's Bull Speedway has one every year. That, I believe, occurring this year in Rutland, Vermont. Uh, TJ, you know, this, this allows fans interaction between some of their favorite stars who they see compete weekly, and uh, it kind of gets you in gear for the upcoming racing season. Um, you know, what, what can fans expect at this Mike Watts Memorial Car Show in Plattsburgh, and um, what does it do to the racing community to help them get, get set for the summer schedule? The the thing with racing is anytime you see a race car on the track, you're always behind a fence. You're never up close to that race car. And, and and because of the pitch, you can never go see that race car many a times. This allows the fans to be able to, at a car show, and especially at the Mike Watts Memorial Car Show at the Crate Civic Center, you're able to go up, you're able to look at that car, you're able to go talk to the driver and meet the person that, that drives that machine. Um, it's a great event for, for kids because kids are always in awe of, of that car on the racetrack. Um, and anything to get kids involved in racing is a, is a huge, huge plus um, to, to keep them involved and, and, and 
car shows, in my opinion, are, are a great way to do that. But also moving it away from the track and putting it in a in a in a central location. I know last year Thunder Road was usually has their car show on on Main Street. They weren't able to do that because of, of the big dig in Barry. Um, but it, it allows not only just race fans, but people just walking the street to go up and look at these race cars and saying, Hey, that's something different. You know, maybe, um, maybe a mother and father can't take their kids to a race every week and they have to really plan the schedule, but the kid really wants to go to the car show and he doesn't, he gets to see that car and, and it makes an instant fan out of him. Um, it's a great way, a great interaction for the fans. Um, and it's a great way to promote not only the drivers, the stars and cars of the track, but your track yourself. And I mean, I know sometimes car shows can be a little tedious and a little, you know, way in one way, but um, tracks who think outside the box and try to include, you know, more of just the regular community and trying to attract new fans, you're seeing those those are the ones that are thriving and growing and, and rebuilding themselves. And, uh, Justin, the, the weekly racing schedule culminates uh, Saturday and Sunday, August 31st and September 1st, with the Mike Watts Memorial Championship Weekend. That will, as I said, wrap up weekly racing. And is it just me, or does it seem like at Airborne Speedway in recent years, you know, they've had a number of different track champions, Todd Stone most recently, Patrick, Patrick Dupree of Saranac Lake, Mike Bruno, now the owner at Devil's Bowl Speedway of Castleton, Vermont, uh, pa- Martin Waugh of Napierville, Quebec. It seems like these championship races come down to that final weekend. Yeah, you're right, and that's something actually that I was thinking about when you guys were speaking earlier, um, you know, just a few minutes ago, is how close those those title races and the modifieds um, always are, and it seems like there's only two cars in it, um, and that's not a, always a bad thing either. I, I think it's a very good thing. Um, in fact, you know, there's there's two teams every year that have seemed to step up their game, and and they're the ones to beat. You know, it was the 24 and the 90 forever and ever up there, uh, Dupree and Watt. Um, you know, George Foley was on his game for a long time. Um, Leon Gagne as well. Um, you know, and then this past year, Todd Stone and, and Pat McGrail. I mean, how cool is that? You know, you've got a Canadian versus an American. Um, two, you know, very different teams. One with, with the very best brand new state of the art equipment um, in, in McGrail. And then Todd Stone, yeah, you know, he's got the big hauler and everybody thinks that they've got billions and billions of dollars for their racing budget, but that's an old car with, uh, with some old technology on it. And, uh, you know, those guys were going at it tooth and nail every week. And it seems like they were trading wins back and forth. And, uh, you knew it was going to come down to the last lap of the final race. And, um, it really did. And, and, uh, it's just, I don't know, there's something about that division up there that, uh, that really seems to turn out a, a close points race every year. Um, that's not to say that it doesn't do that at other tracks. Of course, you know, look at all the times with the exception of last year with Nick Sweet's runaway at Thunder Road. Um, you know, that the late model championship at Thunder Road has been decided by, you know, a pass with five laps to go. Um, you know, I think Pembroke, Scott and Sweet over the last five years, um, you know, the time that, that Jamie Fisher and, and Phil Scott tied for the championship, um, you know, and that, and that goes, you know, there's a, a thousand examples at every racetrack, uh, but it just seems to happen every year up at Airborne. Well, that wraps up this edition of the Vermont Motorsports Magazine Report. We'd like to thank you for listening to our program. For T.J. Anderson and Justin St. Louis, I'm Ricky St. Clair.